Let me wrap up. Uh, it doesn't take long to do Teva. We'll fill in the three blanks. Teva, I mean, uh, serial acquirer. So you really want to pay a lot of attention to the right-hand side of this chart also. Uh, don't be believing uh, 20, 20 or 25 percent growth rates for this company either. Um, 10 percent is probably a, a fairly valid threshold to be in. Um, just to make the point, I mean, just in the last couple of years, they have assimilated um, IVAX and VAR, and they're currently going after Cephalon. So this is a company that uh, kind of behaving like a big fish out there eating the smaller fish. Um, what is kind of fascinating through that entire process is their, their margins have continued to go up. Um, as you read about it in some of the stuff we've done lately, you can see that there is concern about um, you know, how much impact is there going to be on the, the loss of, and it happens in 2014, the loss of their, uh, their patent on their multiple sclerosis drug, Capaxone. And uh, there should be some margin impact there. It's a big piece of the company right now. And the company is obviously working to try to, to maintain and offset what they might perceive as a loss of a competitive advantage out there in a couple years from now. It's really kind of kind of an interesting situation because that's that's what they have thrived on, being a generic drug maker, uh, coming along when drugs, uh, drugs go off patent. And now that their own patented drug, they're basically on the other side of the table fighting the battle. So they certainly know about the other side of the table. So it should be interesting to watch. So again... Uh, margins in that uh, low 20s range make sense to us. We'll just fill in the three blanks, kind of audit away, 10% growth. Again, low 20s for profit margins. Uh, the PE ratios for the company based on our analyst consensus is somewhere in the 15 range. And again, all three of these companies check out to be roughly in the 20% the projected annual return range based on the, uh, the assumptions that we've made. So I did throw them all into their own little dashboard just to compare them side by side. Um, this is the address for the Manifest 40. It's a public dashboard. You can also access it from the home page so you can get to it. And that is basically it. We can actually dig in and, and uh, check into any questions or comments that anybody may have. This is my email address that you see here if you'd like copies of the slides or if you simply have any questions or if you'd like to take advantage of uh, this offer within your investment club, let us know. This is our offer to, uh, special offer to get, uh, to help clubs uh, across the board and get all the partners engaged and we're trying to build more and more programs with Bivio to uh, effectively support investment clubs. Um, any other questions or comments, Lori? Uh, Mary Wrench made a comment about uh, BRLI. Uh, they're paying bonuses to uh, Gendex or GENDX, which is a company they acquired uh, to the former owners. I think there was some kind of contingent payments, that, you know, depending on how the the whole thing panned out. Okay. So they've been doing that for the past couple of years, and uh, probably will be paying that again this year. And she said they are also reducing their debt. Uh, while they're doing that, which might, uh, both things, which probably could help account for the choppy cash flow. Okay. You can note of that. You cannot... All right. Yeah, I'd look at their cash and operations compared to their net income, too. It looks like their receivables are, are increasing uh, quite a bit. And I wonder if they're getting um, delays on, it almost seems in the back of my mind that when I looked at Bar Labs, there was some holdups because do they take Medicare reimbursements or something? Uh, maybe things are coming through slower than they were. Could be. Transactions can be a big part of that in that, that type of business. Transaction yeah. lags. Um, let me go ahead and see if I can't pull up. I'm, I can't believe I seem to have lost a type of chart that I do here. Let me just go to, them to stockcharts.com then. I wanted to, to respond to the, you know, why, why does Apple seem to be so sluggish? And we'll go at it. And here you're looking at, uh, this is basically a year-to-date chart, and you can see that it's been relatively flatter in the trading range for the last several months. Um, let me go ahead and expand this to, well, let's look at a couple years.
And you can see that this is a company that, you know, has had a very strong, this is the, the, pr the price on a daily bas basis going back a couple of years, very strong upward trends, but uh, the relative strength did top out uh, towards the end of last year pretty significantly here, suggesting that, again, we wouldn't be all that surprised by something of a flat spot for some period of time here. Um, I don't see anything that in indicates anything shorter term than that that would explain uh, a loss of momentum on the short term basis, but it, it does appear that uh, in general things are a little more bearish on the company institutionally. So we might dig into that in a little bit more detail. Nothing jumps off the page at me, momentum wise. Anybody else? Comments? Questions? Ann Manning has her hand up. Ann, I unmuted you. Um, I have a question. I noticed on Teva that you uh, pretty much got rid of all the uh, years before. I'm assuming that's because they've made all these acquisitions. Uh, because if you just do a regular uh, SSG and take, don't take those years out, mm -hmm. the earnings just go up and down and up and down. So is that because they were buying these companies? That, for the most part, yeah. You're talking about a company that has, has really changed structure. Uh, you can really see the, the bump up right here for between 2005 and 2006. I'm pretty sure that's IVAX. And then, you know, bar, you know a lot of this, you know, growth here is not organic, it's acquisition related. So that's one of the reasons that we ignore it. You pretty much have to, uh, you know, be careful what you assume about forward acquisitions. I mean, could, you go back to the could you go back to the eagle that you did on that? Mm -hmm. This one? Yes. So again, what you're really thinking about doing, just to put it in context, Ann, is you really want to try to get a handle on, you know, what are the continuing operations of this company going forward? And in the case of a serial acquirer, that historical data, and again, keep in mind that analysts don't restate the historical data during a merger. So the, you know, the, the historical data is not the continuing company going forward. So that, that's the major reason that we're focusing in on the, the years on the far right. Okay, thank you. So all those pieces should continue to grow or, or could continue to grow somewhere in that 10% range. Gene uh, Tinkinson, they also have issued many shares during recent years. Yeah, and again, that's that's part of the capital structure question. Um, one of the one of the things that we use to spot that sort of thing. Let me see if I can jump out to uh, value line. And then we can wrap up here. So I hope you guys have enjoyed taking a look at some of the companies that seems to be that have seemed to be on uh, the mind of our community. In this case, we'll be taking a look at a value line sheet for Teva, and I think I can bump that up size-wise. to where we can actually see something. And here's what Gene is actually describing. Um, when you're looking at the common shares outstanding, this is also a reinforcement of what I just had to say to, to Ann Manning. Um, notice that the company went from 600 uh, million shares outstanding to 700 to 700 to 800, and now they're basically up at that 900 level. So when you're doing your, your, your stock study of the company, you really should be focusing in on that period where the the, share, the shares are up in that 900 million share outstanding range. So you can, and that's one of the ways you spot a change, a material change in the structure of the company. And that's what Gene is pointing out. All right, anything else? Gene uh, Lang has his hand up. I'm Gene, I unmuted you. Just uh, a food for thought here on uh, bioreference. One of the things uh, our online club has been doing is been writing uh, covered calls on uh, bio during this period of time when it's had this price range basically from uh, 20 to 25.50. Mm -hmm. And that's worked out very well for us over the last uh, five to six months. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a topic that we, we really want to do tackle in uh, greater detail here also. And what Gene is referring to is um, on this particular chart, a relative flat spot. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gene, but you're basically saying that during this flat spot in price, you've written right. covered calls to, to basically get a, a, what do they call it, a hybrid or artificial dividend on the company. Right. We have the February 2250s and then the uh, June 25s. When you look at the uh, year 2011, you can see the uh, range there shows as 2034 to 25, 2599, and that mm -hmm. uh, was it worked out well during the period, that particular period for us. So what Gene is describing is what is known as a conservative options strategy. It's one that I, I really do believe that uh, clubs should, especially an experienced club that's got a couple years under its belt, perhaps with a member that has some working knowledge of these, uh, can be a very effective strategy for managing a portfolio. The downside risk is that if it went up to the levels that, that Gene was describing, you would actually lose possession of the stock. So you want to you want to build that strategy based on that awareness and you know what would you sell the company for as you pick those prices but you basically get a a cash payment uh, an artificial dividend in consideration for doing that so yeah thanks it's a good how point you Gene. Decide, how did you decide to use this stock gene to do that well uh, for one thing as you know you gotta have a hundred shares or more so we had uh, 550 shares of it so it gave us an opportunity to uh, write five contracts and um, so any what we do is we are in um, search for uh, bargains with covered calls on any company that we have a hundred shares or more in and obviously uh, more advantageous if you have 500 or more but uh, we're about to uh, look for some contracts on hogs here I've done a little research on that, and there are some pretty decent ones out there. Okay. Yeah, that's something we will, we'll be covering in a little bit more detail. It is definitely a strategy, like I said, that I, I think it would be prudent for uh, especially experienced investment clubs to dig into. It's one of the things we talked about back in February when we discovered that the Beardstown ladies are doing exactly what Gene just described. So, and again... Uh, that, that's a, a club that's been around for a while. Any other comments or questions? Um, this is about a completely different uh, subject, but Herb okay. uh, Lemko is asking about uh, if you have any thoughts about the fast food stocks like McDonald's, Wendy's, Chipotle. Uh, well, is Herb without microphone? Maybe he's got something he would elaborate on. And he usually has a microphone. Yeah, I don't know. And I, I'm it's... mishearing his voice. Uh, Are you out there, Herb? He's got his hand up. Yep. Herb, I unmuted you. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Hi, Herb. Well, How are you holding up in all the summer heat and cloudbursts? Actually, uh, it's been raining, and uh, so the weather's gotten kind of t cooler, so it's really nice. Well, good. It's always nice. So I was just, yeah. Yeah, I was just reading one of the uh, magazines, and they were talking about uh, restaurants, in particular McDonald's, okay. as to the, its growth potential. And, you know, the reason why I thought about it is because I went in there and happened to order their oatmeal, and I was very, very impressed uh, with the quality of the oatmeal. But uh, I also own, uh, you know, Wendy's and uh, Tim Hortons, and I see Tim Hortons right up there at the top, and uh, mm -hmm. that's that. Very good stock for me, and Wendy's went from three dollars and eighty cents up to over five dollars now. So that's been doing very, very well, uh, and it's very cyclical. I mean, they were really t in the toilet, and then all of a sudden now they seem to be coming out of it. Yeah, Wendy's is probably one of your uh, deep value opportunities. You might want to think of it that way. But yeah, the other ones are at the other end of the quality spectrum. Um, I wouldn't fall in love, even though I'm married to a Wendy. Wouldn't fall in love with that company clearly have some tremendous challenges um but yeah I, you were so you're impressed by the oatmeal at mcdonald's you're you're an easy guy to impress herb <laughs> ah. well I, it's got all the fruits in it so i'm, I'm trying to eat healthier you know uh-huh and they're also coming out with their wraps and so it's more of they become more of a full service and starting to look at how people are eating rather than try, trying to push down the uh, just the 
plain old hamburger and, and french fries. Absolutely, yeah, they, it's, it's a very high quality company. You know, and it gives me an opportunity to actually rant a little bit. Uh, I don't, I don't know how often I hear, you know, it's a, it's it's no longer a growth company or it's a non-growth company. You know, I, sometimes I just want to scream. I mean, and it, it and it uh, it goes back to this picture um, that we showed earlier tonight. Uh, you know, how many companies do you see around five percent? And the answer is a, a boatload. There's a boatload of companies around five percent. So. You know, when you take a look at McDonald's and you see this, you know, quote unquote, only five percent, there's nothing wrong with five percent for a relatively large company, and uh, uh, so long as it fits within your portfolio, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a five percent stock. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a, a seven percent return as long as your total portfolio is okay. And uh, again, you know, people people uh, within our community, you know, refer to Procter and Gamble or Johnson and Johnson as uh, no longer quality growth companies. And uh, they've certainly fallen into the mature growth stage. But again, there's nothing wrong with 5% growth. What's interesting about McDonald's is that 20% net margin. That's oh, really yeah. amazing for, the, for a company in that business. Very, very yeah, well managed. You, you know, do. you don't have to even agree with the food. I mean, I like some other food, but don't like so much. And some of it's not so good for my body anymore. But um, it's a company that really does know what they're doing. They apparently make pretty good coffee these days, too. Yeah. I, I think, you know, they, they've been hitting that 20% margin all the time, and all the other restaurants all look to them as the benchmark as to try and figure out how to get to that uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, earnings. So, yeah. It, but it was just one of those things that, you know, we haven't talked about restaurant stocks in a long time. They've been kind of out of favor. But I just thought people may want to go back and look at. It. I mean, they're they're a little bit, you know, yeah, on and the a, a, roller coaster. Actually, but yeah, I actually heard when you say out of favor, uh, we actually did talk about them back when it was the right time to talk about them. You know, twelve to eighteen months ago, and uh, you know, this is actually an illustration here of how much in favor they've been. Just kind of flipping your words on you a little bit. They have been so much in favor. You, you know, some of the the flight to safety or defensive stuff coming out of the recession that their their stock prices you mentioned it with Wendy's their stock prices have jumped up and actually pushed their return forecasts down and uh, that that's why they're out of favor in terms of the amount of discussion that we do around here because that the prices have actually run up so much mm -hmm. so it's just an illustration of you know how how we have behaved you know collectively as a group coming out of that recession the other thing cool. I just thought I'd mention is that the, our meeting for our, my investment club, we took our your uh, manifest investing and looked at uh, the top seven holdings that we have on our club mm -hmm. and compared them to the industry ranking, and every one of them were in the either number one or number two holding uh, for your ranking, which is why we're doing so well. Yeah, and, and somewhere George Nicholson just smiled. I mean, then it's yeah. that it's that. So I think it's it's one of those things that people can do with the manifest investing is put their holdings in there and then key onto it and figure out where their ranking is in and then decide whether or not they want to continue with that holding or if they want to change it out. Sure. Well, thanks, Herb. Very have a great cool. have a great weekend up there. All right, and we're coming up on an hour and fifteen minutes. And we like to uh, turn into a pumpkin about that time. We know that most of you do too. We'll take uh, one last call for questions and let everybody get to their uh, their summer programs. Any 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 last thoughts or John Kimmel? Like John Kimmel just mentioned to look at the casual dining list, which I imagine might include Buffalo Wild Wings, which is also one of the top. All right, so we'll slip into the other style restaurants. A little bit different growth characteristics, a little bit different profitability. And the answer is more growth, less profitability, by the way. Um, I'll sort that by quality. You know, and, and both of those companies at the top of the list here, you know, could have al almost been topics of discussion here tonight, except Chipotle, again, has had a tremendous run-up in price. Um, but Buffalo Wild Wings is, actually did appear on our, our top performers. 
not sure if John had anything else in mind about looking at the list, but uh, it is also... Oh, he mentioned TXRH, Texas Roadhouse, I guess. Texas Roadhouse has actually showed up in manifest screens. I think it was in the Suite 16 this month. And you can see that uh, amongst those type of restaurants, it's uh, got the highest projected return and an excellent quality rating. It's a good study. It's a good study. All right. I think we'll go ahead and wrap up unless you have any anything else you'd want to kick around, Lori. No. Herb, or Marty just says that Herb's suggestion to look at your holdings relative to the industry is a great idea. Well, that's why I did it for him tonight. I figured when we got to the end of that one company, that would just be a great reminder to talk about shopping among the leaders. And, uh, and Herb is... is is very faithful in reminding us of that. Uh, so is Ken Cavola. Shop among the leaders. All right, well, so with that, we'll wish everybody a happy rest of the week. Those of you that are in, so inclined, we do have a roundtable session coming up on Saturday morning. Some of us are getting treated pretty badly by the stocks we picked lately. So you can uh, tune in on Saturday morning and listen to us squirm a little bit. Uh, my selection of Research in Motion has me scratching my head from just a month ago, but Tune in and see me explain my way into the art of catching falling knives. Um, so with that, on behalf of Lori Fredrickson of Bivio, thanks for attending, and we hope you enjoyed it. Let us know if we can do anything else for you. You have my email address right there if you have any comments or questions. And we'll just say good night, everybody. <laughs>